And with that, the stage is yours. All right, awesome. All right, perfect. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Excellent, okay. I got that, that was good. Uh, <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so my name is Pete Stegmeyer. Uh, this is a treasure trove of failures. What history's greatest heist can teach us about defense and depth. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm Pete Stegmeyer. You're probably tired of hearing that by now. I'm kind of tired of saying it. Uh, I've been a senior security engineer for seven years. Uh, in addition to that, I am a heist expert and it feels really douchey to say that. Uh, it's true though. <laughs> Uh, History Channel, Vice, uh, National Geographic have all called me up and asked for like consultations. I've done uh, History's Greatest Heist with Pierce Brosnan uh, as an expert. Uh, and I had a podcast and a book uh, also about a bunch of different heists. Um, so today I wanted to talk about my favorite heist and the parallels between a real world attack and uh, something that we can do in the digital world and how we can either defend against that or exploit it, depending on why you're here. All right, so uh, we're gonna be talking about the Antwerp Diamond Heist. Uh, this happened uh, between February 15th and 16th in February of 2003. Uh, Antwerp, Belgium, uh, this was pulled off by the School of Turin. Uh, we're just gonna do a little bit of like details about everything first, and then we'll get into the process. And what ended up being stolen was between a hundred million and a billion dollars worth of uh, diamonds, gold, jewels, stocks. Uh, and the reason that there is a $900 million range is because what was targeted was actually safety deposit boxes. And a lot of times people don't like to claim what they have in there. So there's no way of actually knowing. And the reason that this uh, happened, believe it or not, like the, th the thieves were very talented but it would not have been possible without just a cascade of failures on behalf of the security team as well. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and start getting into that. Uh, first, let's set the scene with the Diamond Center itself. This is actually, uh, this is kind of like a nested facility. Uh, so the Antwerp Diamond Center handles 80% of global diamond transactions. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty major through point uh, for anybody to try to attack. And because of that, a lot of people thought that it was too big to attack. Uh, it is in the most secure part of Antwerp. They have a dedicated private police force, as well as a local police force located just outside the facility. Uh, and because this is like basically a neighborhood in Antwerp, um, in addition to having all that policing, they also had uh, a way to control traffic. So like a traffic control point uh, with those little car catchers, the little hydraulic spikes that come up. So they could literally control all of the cars coming in and out of this controlled area. And then there were multiple blocks of this diamond center um, where different offices and different jewelers could rent office space and things like that. So there were actually three buildings, A, B, and C block. Uh, and let's get to the vault. Uh, I tried real hard to do like the Ocean's Eleven, George Clooney, real smooth. Like, uh, I, I can't do it. And I like they said something about copyright. I'm kind of scared. I don't want this taken down. So we're just going to describe this vault. And I am not George Clooney. Um, so the first, uh, this vault is a marvel of engineering. Um, it's my favorite vault. Uh, it's weird to have one, but this is it. Uh, and it's got some really, it's got 10 different security features baked into it. Um, number one is a combination lock or a combination dial with 100 million possible combinations. Uh, it is a foot thick of solid steel and there is a 12 inch long key that actually gets separated into two different parts. So there's like the stick part and then the actual teeth uh, or the comb of the, uh, the key. Then there's a day gate, so if you open up that first gate, there's still you know, another, uh, another door stopping you. There's a magnetic sensor that detects if the door is opened. So if that magnetic field breaks, it triggers an alarm. There is a guard, uh, or a guard check, and there's cameras like watching the vault. There's an access card reader. Seismic detector, so you can't, you can't tunnel in. There is a combination motion and thermal sensor uh, that, because they had a lot of false positives, would only set off if it detected both extra temperature 
and motion. So if it just got a little warm, not gonna set it off. If like a mouse is running around, not gonna set it off. But if there's a person, they're warm enough and shaky enough to, to make that happen. And then finally, there are the safe deposit boxes themselves. Um, these are pretty standard, although uh, the owners of the box were given the opportunity to replace uh, basically what was a plastic plate behind uh, the keyhole with a steel plate. And so some people chose to update uh, to that steel plate, some people chose to, uh, you know, not patch everything, and uh, I'll let you guess which ones got hit later. That said, I mean, don't patch everything, like, right away, like, maybe, like, we learned that this week, too, so. Uh, so this is, um, since we're all uh, mostly tech people here, uh, this is basically just a very poorly colored, uh, in retrospect, diagram of what we're looking at. And I just wanted to make this look like a network so you could kind of see the different layers of security and how it would relate to the, cl uh, to the cloud. So over here we've got the world itself, and then we've got our access point here, which is the car catchers of the gateways into that neighborhood. Uh, in there, we've got the actual Diamond Center building. And then within there is another series of access control points, like uh, an elevator that can take you down to the antechamber below the ground for the vault, um, you know, badge readers, guards, things like that. And all of those security uh, controls allow you access to the vault. So it is kind of like a system in that, and it would be a really bad system design if, you know, I don't know, somebody put a open port on this part uh, that connected to the world and then it just kind of had a tunnel to the vault, like that would be really bad and nobody would do that, right? All right, well that's where talk, so. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, so this, this heist was actually pulled off by a group called the School of Turin. Uh, that is not an official name, that is a name that was given to them by the police. Uh, it is also not an accredited school. Uh, this, is a, <laughs> uh, this is a group of highly specialized thieves that work in a collective and they kind of refer each other uh, to jobs based on the skill sets required. So somebody might say, hey, I want to rob this Arby's. And you're going to say, great, we need a safe guy, we need somebody with zero taste buds, we can make this happen. I don't know why I said that, I love Arby's, please. Uh, anyways, sorry, I'm going off on tangents here. Um, yeah, they referred each other based on the skills that they needed, but they were usually organized by, you know, specific masterminds. And in this case, that mastermind was named Leonardo, uh, Leonardo Noter Batarlo. Um, the other thing that this uh, group of thieves was great at was nicknames. Uh, so his was the mastermind, but there was also the monster, uh, who was like damn near seven feet tall. Uh, he specialized in like alarms. There was the genius, who also specialized in alarms and electronics. The king of keys, which is just the coolest name I've ever heard of in my life. And then speedy, because sometimes you run out of budget. <laughs> All right, so how do we plan this heist? Same way that we're gonna try and attack a network, right? So you gotta start with recon. So 18 months prior to the heist, uh, Notre Bartolo just walks up to the office space and rents an office. He says, oh, I've got a jewel company, I'd like to get a safety deposit box, and they said, great, you can stay here as long as you like. Uh, had they run a background check on him, they would have known that he was like, he didn't even like change his name. He'd been arrested many times. Many times. And they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll just give you an access card to the, to the safety deposit box, to the vault, you're good to go. And so he starts by establishing persistence. He goes there multiple times a week and he'll just hang out in his office, he'll go down to the safe. Uh, he wore like hidden cameras in his pockets and in his duffel bag so that he could start mapping this stuff out. And then, after he'd kind of gleaned all the information that he could on that first run, he decides to try to escalate his privileges a little bit and get you know, a higher level of clearance by renting a larger office space. And so he says, hey, you know, I wanna give you guys more money for some more floor space. Uh, could I see some floor plans just so I could pick out the appropriate office? And they said, sure thing. Here's the blueprints for the entire organization. Yeah. 
Uh, so for those of you who keep track at home, that's least privilege. Uh, <laughs> and while he was going over, uh, going over the, uh, the schematics, he saw two fatal flaws. Number one was a door in the parking garage that just opened out to the street. That thing that we said couldn't possibly happen, it happened. And then from that garage, there was a stairwell that took you down into the antechamber past the elevator. So you could just bypass like most of the access controls and be right in the vault room. I sure hope they fired that guy. Uh, but as they were, as they were like, you know, using their cameras and figuring things out, uh, the school of Turin did something that I think is pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, they built a replica vault. Uh, some of these guys, the genius particularly owned a security company. Uh, so he was able to get like the exact like motion detectors and uh, basically they were able to build a complete replica of this vault and they started practicing being able to open it in the dark. Uh, they got some safety deposit boxes and they basically just built a network that they could start running scripts in. All right, so now we gotta plan this thing. Hold on, I'm just gonna grab a drink. Whew, thirsty. All right. So if you're gonna rob a diamond uh, center, best time to do it is Valentine's Day weekend. That's, uh, and this time worked out for a lot of reasons. Number one, Valentine's Day weekend. Either they just sold a lot of diamonds or they have a bunch of unsold diamonds sitting in that safe. So there's extra cash, extra diamonds because everybody's up in their inventory. The next thing that made this particular weekend a really good time was Serena Williams was doing an exhibition tennis match across town. So all of the police were busy like controlling traffic for that because she was a big draw. Uh, so they, they just did the Die Hard 4. Uh, and then also it was a bank holiday so there was a long weekend there and the president of the uh, Diamond Exchange was getting married that week. So all of the executives were at that. So nobody's coming back to the office. Uh, and this, this timing, by the way, if you're familiar with the Bank of Bangladesh heist uh, or uh, hack, they kind of did the same thing. They were able to line up, I believe, an Islamic holiday, uh, a national holiday in the States, and basically made sure that nobody was going to be checking those logs for at least three days. So picking a time like that is super great if you're you know, a thief or trying to find the right time to attack. But if you're looking to defend your networks, don't just think about like, hey guys, long weekend. You know, make sure that there are systems in place, you know, so this doesn't happen. They did have a security guard that was supposed to be there. Uh, he took the night off just because he was getting drunk with his brother. So next, uh, we've got our final prep work before the heist. So five days before, the genius just takes Notre Bartolo's access card, swipes in because there was no other form of authentication. If you had the key card, you were fine. And he actually goes into the vault in the evening and starts testing a, uh, a way to uh, bypass that magnetic sensor. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty advanced system and he solved it with like $20 worth of stuff, uh, which I just love. That's, that's part of the reason this is my favorite. It's like just, they did really cool stuff. Don't do it, but like, don't, don't not do it. Uh, <laughs> so, and we're gonna, I'll show you that in a, in a little bit here. Uh, three days before the heist, uh, and by the way, he, they almost got caught five days out when he was trying to leave. And then he just turned around and slept in the office because he saw security guards like checking IDs. And nobody thought that that was weird. Um, so three days before the heist, uh, Notre Bartolo is going into the safe again to just, you know, conduct his business and make sure everything is still looking, you know, good for a heist in. And he places a hidden camera over the vault door. And this is gonna give them a view of the combination. So when somebody goes to open it, they can hopefully, you know, see those numbers, the 100 million possible combinations. This is my favorite part. The day before the heist, uh, right, before, uh, right before closing, Notre Bartolo takes out a bottle of hairspray 
and he sprays the heat and uh, motion sensor with a light film of hairspray that basically just disrupted it enough to not notice the increase in heat right away. And so because of that, it could detect motion and they bought themselves a few extra minutes before the heat was hot enough to, to go ahead and do that. Uh, just honestly genius. And then they got themselves a nice sandwich plate. That's gonna come into play later. But always like, if you're gonna do a crime, like eat up. All right, so we're at the day of the heist now. They enter through the garage, just like that uh, problem in the schematics showed them to do. Uh, they started taking like Crown Royal bags and covering all the cameras because they knew exactly where those were as well. Um, this device here, if you can see it on the, the right hand side of the slide, it's basically just an aluminum plate that he stuck two-sided tape on. So it had a magnet, it had two-sided tape, and then basically he just unscrewed the bolts so that when he took the, th the whole sensor off the door, it stayed together and it never broke that magnetic seal because they were taped together. So, doesn't matter how smart your system is, something stupid can and will beat it. Um, so the next thing they do is they open the vault door and they turn the lights off because there are the uh, light detectors in there. And then the genius basically, he takes like a styrofoam cooler and puts it over the heat sensor. So this is gonna block motion and it's gonna insulate the temperature. So now that's out of the way. Uh, the seven foot tall guy disables the alarm on the top of the, uh, on the top of the safe. And then they go to actually get the keys themselves. Now bear in mind, I said before, this is a uh, two foot long or a foot long key kept in two different spots, except it's not. They just put it in the coat closet next to the safe door and they didn't take it apart. <laughs> oh, if you like that, just here we go. The combination lock, you know, the hundred million combinations, turns out that's as much of a pain in the ass for a thief to figure out as it is for the security guy. So when he closed the vault that night, he just didn't spin the lock. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes your man on the inside doesn't even realize that he's on the inside. He doesn't know anything. And then they just open the, uh, the day gate with a crowbar because sometimes the classics work. So this is the hall. Of the 160 safe uh, deposit boxes, 123 of them got looted. Uh, including Notar Bartolo's own. Um, I, I like to think that he was just doing it to like blend in, but in reality, he was probably just too cheap to get the new plate because the, the only boxes that weren't opened with that tool uh, that basically just snapped the back plate off to open the lock was the ones where they spent the extra $20 to upgrade to the steel plate. Patch your stuff. Don't. Don't be cheap when it comes to like keeping your diamonds safe. They stole so much stuff that they had to start like prioritizing and they left like tens of millions of dollars worth of diamonds and cash just on the floor because it was too heavy. Hashtag goals. <laughs> Once they were done, and this, this heist by the way lasted three days. Um, yeah, because everybody was gone, they just kept coming back and stealing more stuff. <laughs> and nobody figured like, hey, like, maybe I should like check the vault, make sure like, nobody stole the money. It's weird, but like, you know, that's the thing I should check. They, didn't, they just didn't do it. Uh, and then also, um, the, the Diamond Center themselves, like after the heist was finally completed, they're like, oh, we gotta go grab those videotapes. So they went up to the second story guard shack where the tapes were, and they just removed, they just took them out of the VCR. That's right, they were still using uh, VHS tapes because they didn't want to spend the extra money on DVRs. So had they you know, not done that, or had they updated it, we would have caught these people a lot sooner, but they decided, you know, who's gonna break into the vault? All right, so now we get to kind of the, uh, 
the fun part where everything falls apart. They get away initially. About two hours into the drive uh, back to Italy where all these guys were from, Speedy, the discount henchman, starts freaking out. He's never flown this close to the sun before. And so he starts like just throwing trash out of the window of their getaway car. I'm gonna say this right now. Rule number one of performing a crime, only do one crime at a time. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, if you got a Monet in your back seat, do the speed limit. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Speedy, though, he started freaking out and he just pulls over and he's like, we gotta burn this evidence because they had like trash bags full of evidence. So I guess rule two would be don't drive with trash bags full of incriminating evidence. I shouldn't have to say that one. Uh, but yeah, they, they basically, he started panicking and he started trying to burn all of the evidence in a, in a burn barrel. And when he realized that wasn't gonna happen, he just kind of dumped it on the side of the road. And then in a, uh, a weird fun twist of fate, the exact spot that he picked uh, to dump his trash was the spot where like an old curmudgeonly farmer had just kept calling the police because of the dang kids who were also dumping trash there. It was, like, it was just like a good spot for trash. And so he, he's like, oh, these kids, they, they did the trash again. And so the police are like, sure, Harold. And then they start going out there and they start seeing envelopes that say Antwerp Diamond Center. And like pieces of videotape from the, the cameras and diamonds. They threw away diamonds. They also found some half-eaten sandwiches. And from the sandwiches, this is my favorite part, they were able to start like looking through security camera footage and they saw like the receipt was purchased like from a shop next to the diamond center. And then they saw the, the camera footage of that and they're like, who's this weird seven foot tall guy buying a bunch of sandwiches? So another rule, delete your cookies. <laughs> That's the one I'm gonna do this for. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, all right. So the other thing that happened after this is Notre Bartolo, I'm, this is too dark, that was just a gag. Uh, <laughs> Notre Bartolo, he decides in what might be the dumbest move I've ever seen, he's like, you know what I'm gonna do on Monday? I'm gonna show up back to the office, be like, what happened? And you know, play it like, like an innocent man would do. Don't do that. If you escape the country, don't go back. Don't, like, but he did that, and then the police were kinda there waiting for him already. And then they went to his apartment that he rented in town and they found a bunch of uh, what's called pointer emeralds stuck in his carpet. Those are like the little tiny emeralds that like, if you're, like if Cartier does like those Jaguar heads that are like the little tiny stones, those are usually pointer emeralds. They're more or less worthless, but you know, it's like finding, you know, a, a perfect mashing hash, like in a file dump or something like that. It's just something that could only be from that. So, all of them with the exception of the King of Keys, who to this day, nobody knows who he is, they all got arrested. Um, they, on average, served three years in prison and they never recovered any of the money or the diamonds. <laughs> Which brings me to fun crime fact number four, or tip, I guess. If you're gonna perform a heist, do it in Europe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, these, these guys, they ended up, uh, yeah, they're, they're somewhere like retired with a bunch of money and a bunch of diamonds and it's just, I love that for them. <laughs> uh, but there are lessons that, that we can take from this as well, especially on the security side. Number one, defense in depth, like that, that vault door had 10 different security features alone, but it only works if you do it properly. Because the specter of security is not in fact security. Like you can think something is secure,
but unless you're actually, you know, walking the walk, it doesn't really matter. Um, complacency is the enemy of complexity. So again, if something is tedious for you, don't make it easy for you at the expense of making it easy for somebody to pull off the heist of a lifetime. You're worth that 30 seconds. Like the number of people that just like won't bother putting like MFA on their phones like blows my mind. And finally, stupid and or lazy can be dangerous both ways. It can be dangerous on the blue team, it can be dangerous on the red team. So make sure that you're you know, taking care of yourself, that you're being thorough about things, and that you're actually thinking about things in a layered approach. Like, defensive depth like, is all about compensating controls. If something happens, like, these guys just jumped out of a plane with 60 parachutes and not one of them went off. Like, that's, that's a problem. Don't, don't do that. That's gonna make you fall faster because of the weight. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the main takeaways from there. Uh, do we have any questions? I I wish I I'm gonna be honest I am 40 years old I still get a brain freeze when I eat ice cream I can't I can't do that what's up I mean I like them Yes. You can come to this microphone for questions so everybody can hear the question. Is it possible that the German police are retired in the islands? I, I'm not going to say it's impossible. Um, you never know like where people are going to have inside uh, inside people, I personally feel like somebody had to have gotten paid off with this just because of the sheer, like it's almost like mathematically impossible negligence. Um, but yeah, um, so that's definitely possible. What changes did they make as a result of this to make it not happen again? Uh, so number one, they stopped giving out blueprints. Uh, <laughs> um, and some of the other things that happened is um, they started really forcing through those updates, like the security cameras, like they weren't waiting, they weren't making excuses to stop spending money or to, you know, not spend the money. They updated their systems there. They made sure that they were staying ahead of trends. And they also worked on like actual enforcement so that, um, you know, these things that they set up to work could actually do their job. Yes. Is there a movie about this? Uh, not about this one specifically, actually. There should be. That's the real crime. Uh, <laughs> um, so, stay away, you. Uh, so, what is the answer to the that type of complacency issue? Because I think that's something we see a lot when it comes to, for example, you know, self-driving cars. The difference between asking people to remain alert all the time and asking people to just, oh, it's fine, until it suddenly isn't, is a big one, right? So how do you get people to, to take that key and split it in half and put it away properly every single time? I, I, I think the solution for that has to be some sort of accountability. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't fix anything you know, necessarily in the long term, but if all of a sudden you know, these leaders and things like that are or you know, their managers are checking to make sure that like the jobs are completed, uh, making sure that you know due diligence is performed, and making sure that you know there is something, there's some sort of teeth that are gonna you know prevent that from happening. Like, uh, if say you push uh, an untested update out to a billion computers, uh, you know, probably get fired at the very least, or some fines or something, you know. I mean, that's a hypothetical. Uh, <laughs> that wouldn't happen. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, uh, this was a dream comes true, so thanks, everybody.